So I'll try it again at the end of this lecture and show you that stuff uh, hopefully uh, next time. Okay, so for today, uh, we're going to start with nonlinear analysis. Okay, uh, before we do that, I wanted to uh, do a little bit of review. So um, I, I wanted to give you the, the, uh, the past three weeks in perspective and show you how all of these things fit into the grand scheme of things. So um, we began by building a great little playground. And within that playground, we said that by enforcing upon ourselves the lump matter discipline, we created the lump circuit abstraction. So within that play field, we assumed that we had dq by dt and d5 by dt to be zero. And so uh, that gave us the lump circuit abstraction. And within that lump circuit abstraction, within this playground, we looked at several methods of analyzing circuits, uh, including the KVL-KCL method. We also learned the method involving uh, composing uh, resistors, the voltage dividers, and so on, and uh, solving circuits intuitively. And we also looked at the node method, which is kind of the workhorse of the circuits industry. So when in doubt, apply the node method, and it will get you uh, where you want to go. Now, we also said that, that this was good. Here's our playground. We said, hey, if we focus on those circuits that are linear, we come to the left part of our playground, OK? And we said that for linear circuits in this part of the playground, we can further use a couple of techniques, a few techniques, superposition, Thevenin, Norton, and so on. So these techniques allow you to very quickly analyze complicated circuits, especially when you're looking to find a single current or voltage or some parameter of interest. Whenever you see, if you see a circuit containing multiple voltage sources or two or more voltage sources or current sources, as a first step, think superposition. Okay? And uh, so in, these are very powerful techniques that let you analyze very complicated circuits very effectively. So after we did this, we said, uh, oh, um, let me draw another playground here. Uh, this is the... Another piece of our playground, and if this is linear circuits, then uh, this half of the playground is nonlinear circuits. And we said that if we further focus, if we further focus on discretized values, if you discretize values and focused only on circuits that dealt with binary signals, highs and lows, then we came into this small regime of the playground. And notice that digital circuits are, by the very nature, nonlinear. Okay, remember, uh, remember this circuit. A, B. Uh, this was one of our uh, NOR gate circuits. And uh, if you look at our transfer functions, that is, if I plot, let's say, for example, for some combination of... Uh, Input, input values, let's say I plot V in versus V out. Uh, let's say, for example, I turn uh, this guy off by uh, setting V to zero, and then I simply apply a low to high transition at uh, V in, then what I would see at the output is a transfer function of the following sort, where as V in changes, the output switches at some point and then stays at a low value. Okay, so when V in is low, V out is high, and V in is high, V out is uh, low. So that's kind of the V out versus V in when B is set at zero. So notice that this is a nonlinear curve. Okay, this is not a straight line. Uh, it's a nonlinear curve. And so therefore, in the digital domain, we see functions, highly nonlinear functions that look like this and so on. However, however, take a look at this circuit. Suppose 
I focus on the circuit for a given set of switch settings. Okay? So let's say, for example, I focus on the circuit when A and B are both ones. For a given set of switch settings, notice that I'm going to be either in this region or in this region. Notice that uh, this region is a straight line. Okay, so if I focus on, let's say both A and B are ones, then I get something like this. Okay, and in this situation, for a given set of switch settings, notice that my digital circuit now can be analyzed using linear techniques. So therefore, my digital gets moved into the linear domain for a given set of switch settings. Okay, so if I fix my switch settings and look at the circuit, then each circuit for a given set of switch settings is comprised of voltage sources and some resistors, and it's a linear circuit. So, again, I can go back and apply all my linear technique to, techniques to virtually all the digital circuits that you will be dealing with in 6002. Okay? Again, remember, if I fix my switch settings, if I fix the inputs, then the output can be determined using linear techniques because the, the digital circuits we're showing you in 6002 uh, simply comprise linear elements like voltage sources and resistors and so on. You'll see some more later, but you can apply uh, your linear techniques and uh, analyze them. So uh, the cool thing here is that with just two weeks of stuff that you've learned in 6002, you are well on your way to being able to analyze a certain classes of digital circuits for a given set of switch settings and many, many, many linear circuits. Okay? <clears throat> what we'll do today is focus on nonlinear circuits. Okay? So we look at the space. <clears throat> Notice again that up to now we dealt with these three methods which apply to all circuits within this playground, the lump circuit playground, and the subset of that is the linear domain. And we can analyze many lin uh, we can analyze linear circuits in this way. And digital circuits for a given set of switch settings also fall within this category. So notice that uh, you can go ahead and analyze the digital circuits using uh, superposition or you know, other, um, other techniques like that. So the next big step for us is to begin our analysis of nonlinear circuits today. The important thing to remember is that nonlinear circuits are also within the big playground in which we have assumed the, uh, in which we are going under the lump matter discipline, okay? So uh, nonlinear circuits are also lump circuits, and therefore, because we are in that playground, we can uh, use any one of our techniques, KVL, KCL, or the node method, to analyze the nonlinear circuits. So if you see a nonlinear circuit, don't get daunted. Say, just remember, you know, this is meant to be simple stuff. So let's, let, let me simply write down the node equation and analyze it. Okay, there's nothing, there's really nothing new in today's lecture. I'm just going to show you a nonlinear circuit and analyzing using techniques that uh, you already know. So today, uh, nonlinear circuits, and we look at several methods of analyzing nonlinear circuits. We look at the analytic method. We look at a graphical method. <clears throat> you will look at a piecewise linear method in the, uh, in the book. <clears throat> I won't be covering this in lecture. Uh, you can read the uh, section 4.4 uh, for the piecewise linear method. Uh, in this method, uh, you, take, uh, you take your curves and you approximate them with a bunch of straight line segments, um, you know, kind of uh, like uh, the V out V in curve I've shown you there, and analyze the circuit using linear techniques within any given straight line segment. Okay. Um, we'll also do incremental analysis. 
This is also called small signal analysis. Okay, so I will cover these two today. I will in introduce this one today and wrap that up uh, on, during the next lecture. <clears throat> okay, so let's, uh, let's start with a simple example. Okay, so I have some voltage uh, V, it's some voltage source V, and I have some resistor R, and I have a fictitious device here that I, that, uh, I label D, okay? Let's call this fictitious device the Expo Dweeb. Okay, I've probably chosen a uh, funky name because this is a fictitious device, okay? Let's call it the Expo Dweeb. And, uh, let me write down the associated variables for this device as follows. ID is the current flowing uh, into this terminal, and VD is the voltage across uh, this device. So this is a nonlinear device, and uh, and uh, this device is characterized by the following equation. Much like resistors were characterized by a IV relation, V is equal to IR, or I is equal to uh, V divided by R. Uh, this device is also characterized by the following element relationship. It's A, E raised to B. Okay, so there's the exponentiation here. And uh, again, remember this is a fictitious device, and I'll show you some uh, funky things that it does in a second. So... Um, it's a very simple relation, the exponential relation, where the current relates to the uh, exponentiated value of the uh, voltage VD across the uh, element. So I can plot ID versus, ID versus VD for this uh, element as follows. Uh, notice that uh, when VD is zero, uh, ID is A, so I have A here, and it looks like, looks like this. Okay, it's a funny device, a fictitious device. So when VD is zero, um, I have some current flowing through the device, and as VD increases, I get an exponential increase in the current through that uh, device. Um, this device is funny in the sense that it is not a passive device in that Notice that when VD and ID are positive, the product is positive, which is fine, uh, which says that uh, it is consuming power. On the other hand, on the left-hand side, notice that the VI relation is negative, which means that when I put a negative voltage on it, it can still sustain a positive current. This must imply that the device is producing power, okay? But for the purpose of a nonlinear analysis, uh, we, don't, we don't have to worry about that. Let's just do it. Uh, mathematically and find out what it looks like. So uh, back to this again, I have a voltage source, a resistor, and my export dweeb connected in that manner. Now again, reflect on this pattern. A voltage source or a current source, uh, uh, a resistor, and some device. This is a very standard pattern you will see again and again and again. In particular, if you look at this device, the nonlinear device here, and facing the nonlinear device is a voltage source in series with the resistor. Now, the reason I say that this is an incredibly important pattern is the following. Notice that, suppose, notice that if on the left-hand side I had any linear circuit, okay, and I had a single nonlinear element in that circuit, notice that by a Thevenin reduction that you've learned, you can take this entire mess. If all you care about is the behavior of the nonlinear device, for the purpose of analyzing this nonlinear device, you can take this entire linear circuit. Okay, no matter how complicated it is, you know, voltage sources, current sources, resistors, and a bunch of other funky stuff, you can boil all of that down to a Thevenin equivalent, a voltage and a resistor in series. Okay, so, no, so, so we can trick you. Okay, we can give you a complicated circuit and say, aha, 
tell me what the current is through this device if I apply you know, some voltage, three volts uh, there. What you can do is you can say, aha, I don't care about what happens here. So I'm just going to replace the whole thing with the Thevenin equivalent. OK, and you've done a homework now, and you can calculate Thevenin equivalents for circuits. And simply replace this, and then go ahead and solve the circuit. Again, remember, uh, we are engineers. OK, we are, we are looking for answers. We are looking to build interesting systems. OK, and in general, we like to take the simplest path possible to the solution. OK, so simplify your lives and create a simple Thevenin coupled to a nonlinear device, and then you will, be, uh, you will be rolling. So when we talk about a variety of other circuits, OK, nonlinear circuits, time-varying circuits, and so on in the rest of this course, we will look at this pattern again and again and again and again to be blue in the face. And just remember, the reason we keep looking at this pattern is that whenever you have some big linear mass okay, connected to some interesting device, Okay, what you can do is, if all you care about is analyzing the behavior of that device, you can take this linear mass and simply figure out the Thevenin equivalent or the Norton equivalent, if you like, and replace this whole thing with its equivalent and then go ahead and analyze it. Okay, so you boil, boil you know, an arbitrarily complicated circuit down to a very simple pattern of the sort. Okay, what this means is because of this brilliant Thevenin sim simplification, going forward through the rest of this course, we'll mostly deal with very simple circuits like this. Voltage source, resistor, and the device. That's it. Very, 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 very rarely will you see multiple sources, uh, you know, and, and lots of resistors in a circuit. It's usually going to be simple stuff. And, and remember how we got here, okay? By making a Thevenin simplification of a linear mass. All right. So, uh, so if in homeworks or quizzes or in real life, if you find that, or in many examples of real life, if you find that you have to deal with a lot of grunge and a lot of mess, uh, step back and think a little bit. Okay, try to use intuition and see if you can simplify things using some clever trick or uh, a method. Okay. Method one of analysis. So let's go ahead and analyze this uh, pattern here this template circuit, if you will, a voltage source, a resistor, and a nonlinear device. So uh, this is the uh, analytical method. And uh, remember, the node, uh, node equation, the node method applies. So let me go ahead and apply the uh, node method. So to apply the node method, what do I do? I first have to select the ground node. OK, let me select this as my ground node. Let me label all the nodes with their voltages. So this node has voltage V. And this node has uh, a label V capital D. OK, so let me go ahead and analyze this using the node method. So node method says, for each of the nodes in the circuit whose voltage is not known, go ahead and write down KCL, implicitly applying the element relationships to replace the current values with the voltage values. OK, so let's start with uh, the current going in that direction, current going uh, from the VD node through resistor R looks as follows, is VD minus V divided by R. That's the current going that away. And the current going down is ID. OK, in general, when I apply the node method, I don't write ID here, but I go ahead and write the element relation A e to the BVD here. OK, I have an, then I get an equation in VD and I just solve for it, solve for the node voltage. However, um, uh, just to make a couple of extra points later, let me go ahead and do that in two steps. Uh, write down uh, this, and then go ahead and write down ID separately as A e to the B V D. Again, remember, uh, don't get confused here. In the node method, I don't write down a second step. I directly write down A e to the B V D in place of ID. I get one equation in VD, I go solve it. Um, just for fun today, I'm writing, taking two steps here, writing ID here, and explicitly putting down ID as A e to the BVD. OK, now that's it. I mean, this is all there is to it. OK, you guys can now go ahead and analyze nonlinear circuits. 
Okay, you get a bunch of equations, a bunch of unknowns, you know, go solve. You know, I have two equations here. VD and ID are my unknowns, and I can just go ahead and uh, solve for them. Now, in general, f with nonlinear circuits, oftentimes it's hard to get a closed form solution. Okay, so uh, you may have to use a bunch of methods. You, know, you can try a closed form solution, or you can try numerical solutions. Okay, or you can do trial and error. Okay, in this case, um, I'll just go ahead and tell you, suppose I choose V is uh, uh, 1 volt, R is 1 ohm, and B is uh, 1, uh, 1 over volt, and A is 1 fourth amps for those values. Um, approximately VD is roughly 0.5 volts, and ID is roughly 0.4 volts. Okay, you can do this, uh, you know, uh, using trial and error or uh, other other methods. Um, in 6002, we don't dwell on having uh, working too hard to solve equations of this sort. If you cannot substitute this in here and solve it directly, uh, we don't ask you to go and learn numerical method techniques and so on to solve it. But uh, just remember that uh, uh, you can use trial and error, or you know, you can use back substitution and uh, other techniques that you'll learn in future uh, numerical methods classes uh, and apply them here. But suffice it to say that, you know, for here, well, we can stick with trial and error if you like. And uh, for these values, VD and ID are 0.5 and uh, approximately 0.4. We're done. It's, it's really that simple. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good catch. I know at least one person ain't sleeping here. Okay. Good. So, um, so, so as I said, there's not a whole lot to it. You know, uh, whether it's a nonlinear circuit or a linear circuit, and as long as I am inside this playground here, where the lump circuit abstraction holds, um, I can apply my node equations and then go ahead and solve it. Well, let me show you a few more methods uh, so, so we can uh, articulate your repertoire of tools for nonlinear circuits. And uh, I'd like to show you a graphical technique. Um, I personally rarely use a graphical technique to solve circuits. Okay? Then, uh, you know, why, why am I sharing this with you? It turns out that uh, oftentimes, by looking at things graphically, you, you, you can get some better insights into circuit behavior. Okay? Uh, you can also show cool demos when you show graphs of circuit, you know, uh, graphs of responses kind of playing with each other and so on. So, uh, so this is fun for doing, you know, getting intuition and things like that. So uh, graphically, all I'm really going to do is uh, solve those two equations graphically. Um, so I'm going to plot uh, equation one. Uh, let me rewrite equation one as follows. Um, ID is I'm just rewriting equation one um, as follows. Uh, v, v by R minus VD by uh, divided by R. And uh, uh, oops. Okay. And I can also uh, draw the second guy. Okay, I can do this, uh, uh, do this as well. I can do an ID, ID versus uh, VD plot. And in this particular situation, you've seen this already. Okay, that's my uh, ID versus VD curve right there. And I can do the same for this one here. Uh, let me find, uh, so this, this equation establishes uh, the following straight line relationship. Uh, it says that uh, when uh, VD is zero, when VD is zero, ID is V divided by R. So that's here. And similarly, when ID is zero, then VD is equal to V. So I get something here. Okay, so that's my straight line relationship uh, corresponding to this equation here. So what I can do is I can simply solve these by superimposing the two curves 
on the same VDID uh, uh, template here and finding the intersection of the curves. So I can take this curve corresponding to 2, and I can take this curve corresponding to 1, and this is uh, V divided by R, and this is V, 0, and I can find the intersection point. <coughs> Uh, this curve here, for reasons that will be obvious uh, about uh, three weeks from now, is called uh, the load line. Okay, it's called the load line. Uh, but you'll understand uh, why that is so uh, in a later in a later lecture. Okay, so uh, so you, um, I've given you a template on page six to uh, boil these two down onto one uh, uh, one equation. So there again, you know, you can substitute the values for. Uh, v is one volt and uh, R is one and so on and so forth and get the same kind of uh, result as you did uh, previously. <clears throat> so th th there's really nothing new here. All I've done in the second method is combine the two equations graphically and found the solution by looking at where the two curves intersect. Okay. Um, At the start of this lecture, I also told you that uh, uh, you may want to go and check out the piecewise linear technique. In section 4.4 of the uh, course notes. All right. So for today, let me do a third method called incremental analysis. Okay, this technique is also called uh, the small signal method. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, before I go into the method, uh, in today's lecture what I'll do is I'll give you a motivating example, okay, for why we need the small signal approach. I'll give a motiv motivating example and uh, show you a little demo, okay? And then I will close with uh, showing you a problem with applying a uh, standard approach, and I'll ask you to see if you can figure out uh, a way to handle it, uh, you know, in time for next lecture. Okay, so let me, let me give you the motivation here. <clears throat> so here's what I want to do. So uh, many of you have seen a, uh, one of those uh, electric eye garage door openers, right? So you have a, uh, uh, a receiver at one end and you have uh, some kind of a light beam at the other. And uh, when, you, uh, when you walk through, it stops, or rather it cuts the circuit and uh, stops the door from closing. And when you, uh, you know, when no one's going through, it maintains a uh, connection and lets the door close. So uh, what we did is we went, to the, we went to Home Depot or one of those stores and bought a very standard uh, uh, device that uh, essentially has, uh, produces some response when light impinges on it. And my goal will be to see if I can send music over a, uh, uh, you know, a, over a light beam. Uh, using a simple garage door opener uh, device. Okay, so here's, here's a little circuit that I'll do. So we actually went in and built this. I'll also show you a demo. Um, so, so here's my time varying voltage, VT, uh, VI, and uh, this is some music, some music, some music signal. Get some music signal, and uh, I'm going to connect this to my uh, to this device, okay, which is uh, which is a device found in garage door openers. I'm going to call it a uh, LED. Uh, if you like, you can view it as a. This is very similar to our export dweeb. Uh, this is called a light emitting export dweeb. 
Okay, that's why it's LED. So, uh, so what the light emitting ex expo dweeb does is, um, as I apply this voltage across it, uh, that same voltage ap appears across the uh, uh, light emitting expo dweeb, and uh, there's some current that flows through the device. Okay, and for uh, for our analysis, we will assume that this device is virtually has an identical IV characteristic to the uh, expo dweeb, just that it emits light. Okay, so when I pass a current through it, it emits light. Okay, and the light intensity is proportional to the current that flows through. Okay, so it emits light, and light in intensity, LD, is proportional to ID. Okay, so here's my little uh, light emitting device, which when current flows through it, it uh, produces light whose intensity is uh, proportional to the current. And what I'll do is I'll stick in the receiver here. Okay, I, I think of it as a uh, uh, photoresistor or you know some other uh, device where I'm going to connect that in a circuit. I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, this side. I'm going to focus on the left-hand side here. And uh, let's say I have some kind of amplifier and uh, speakers and so on and so forth. Suffice it to say that when the, when the light falls on this device PR, uh, that IR that uh, goes through here is proportional to the received light intensity. Okay? So um, if the current is proportional to the received light intensity, then I amplify that signal uh, in my amplifier and I get the music playing out here. Okay? And uh, notice that. Uh, the following chain of dependencies apply. So I have an input music signal VI. That gets converted to some uh, ID. These are all time varying signals. Okay, so VI is a time varying signal, so is uh, ID. And uh, ID gets converted to light of some intensity LD. Okay, this in turn. Uh, gets attenuated somewhat and is received at the uh, uh, photo uh, resistor, and uh, I get some intensity LR impinging on that, uh, that device there, and that in turn produces a current IR, and then IR <coughs> is amplified and goes through a speaker and so on and produces sound. So notice that using this chain, I've taken the music signal here, and I'm playing it here. Okay, and just, just imagine that this is your garage door opener uh, device here where the light being emitted is being articulated by the voltage signal, VI, and received here. And so notice that if I cut this, if I, if I, if I stick something in here, I block it, then I get no uh, response here. But if I take my hand away, then I do get uh, some response. So this is fine, okay? So this should work. Okay, you can try this at home if you like, you know, but if you have a garage door opener, just, just you know, stick a little circuit like this and it should simply work. We have a problem though. The problem is that, as I said, I'm using the Expo Dweeb here, the light emitting Expo Dweeb, and its characteristics are as follows. Okay, ID is exponentially related to the voltage VD. Okay, so this is nonlinear. <clears throat> and that's a real problem. Okay, because this is nonlinear, I am going to get a uh, distorted output. Well, let me show you a little uh, the waveform, a little graph to show you how the distortion happens, and then show you a little demo. Uh, showing you the distortion. So uh, let me graphically show you the kind of distortion that's happening here. And I'll do it by drawing the following uh, graph. OK, so this is the uh, VD ID curve for our device. OK, and what I'm going to plot for you is if I have a time varying VD voltage, I just want to see what the time varying ID current looks like. And uh, a trick to plot that is to take your input voltage 
like so. And uh, you know, let's say I apply a, a sinusoid. So I'm just taking a, uh, a time-varying sinusoidal voltage and plotting it, uh, just rotating the plot 90 degrees like so. So I can see where these points correspond to on that curve. Okay. So what this says is that at some point here, for example, where uh, VI at this point in time, when VI is here, notice VI and VD are the same thing. Okay, because VI is applied across VD. Okay, VI directly applies across the uh, device, and so VI equals VD at all time. So, uh, so this this voltage here corresponds to uh, this voltage, which corresponds to this current, and then I can find out what the current is for that uh, that voltage. Uh, using the same artifice, let me I can plot uh, the output current ID like so. Um, so for this value, I get uh, some current here. And uh, so that at time t0, I start here. And notice that as this signal moves up here, I can find out the corresponding values of ID by looking at where a straight line from here intersects here and plotting the values here. I had a nice little graphical animation to show you this. Uh, hopefully the laptop will work tomorrow and uh, we can check that. I'm, I'm doing nothing new here, just showing you a, a trick to be able to plot VI versus V out relationships based, or, or VI versus uh, other relationships based on uh, some kind of a transfer function. So uh, what you end up getting is something that looks like this. Why is that? Notice that uh, this curve here corresponds to the signal. Uh, as this signal moves from here to here, this point moves from here to here, and that corresponds to uh, this ID. When this moves from here to here, that corresponds to uh, a point moving from this part of the curve to here, and that looks like so. And then for the whole negative incursion, notice that the whole negative incursion uh, moves here. Okay, so for that entire negative incursion, I get an output that looks like this. Notice that this device has completely cut off and hammered um, negative going uh, signals. Okay, what it's done is that rather than giving me a nice little negative uh, the spike um, uh, incursion here, well, excursion here, what this is doing is that it's taking this excursion and simply slamming it down to uh, uh, this value here. Okay, and then again, when I go back up, I get this peak here. So notice that what was a nice little sinusoid out there gets uh, hammered and squished into this funny curve here. Okay, what this device is doing is for positive values, it tends to produce exponentially greater current. So I get, you know, boom, high rising peaks corresponding to these two. And for negative going currents, negative going voltages, it simply compresses them to a low positive value here. And that's what I see here corresponding to negative excursions. So notice, so what this will do is, uh, if, if, I, if I view sound, if I input sound here, when sound has negative going excursions, it will simply scrunch them. Okay, and uh, but more or less let the positive things through, and uh, that is going to give rise to a bunch of distortion in my in my signal. So I'd like to show you a little demo. Um, actually, we've gone ahead and built a little device like this. Okay, we have an honest to goodness little uh, device, you know, costing you know I, I don't know 50 cents or a buck or something. Um, it's a little voltage. Uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a device that emits light proportional to the current flowing through it. I have a receiver. And uh, I'm going to play some music, and uh, you will listen to uh, the output here. Okay, and uh, hopefully you should see a bunch of distortion because of that, uh, that effect that I showed you. Okay. And uh, what I'll do is, uh, uh, b before we do that, uh, you'll see two curves up there. The yellow, I believe, is the VI, is the input, and the green, I believe is a signal proportional to uh, yeah, other way. Around. Oh, I see. So green is the input. So green, the lower one is the input, and the upper one is the distorted output. Okay, so we're going to play some sound through it and uh, music through it, and uh, you can listen through a little CD player.
so, so a couple things. The good news, the good news is that it works. Okay. <laughs> However, I doubt that uh, you know uh, uh, that music artists will come to my studio to uh, to record if this is the quality of what I produce. So do notice that uh, th there are hardly any negative going excursions in that curve up there, right? All the negative negative ones have been like you know scrunched up down into uh, a flat line there, and that's the reason I get this distortion. And just to prove to you that I am indeed using a garage door opener device and you know not faking it here, um, I'm going to just you know uh, shut the music off, shut the uh, signal off by stopping the light. You know, using a piece of paper here. So notice that, uh, that this device here uh, is a little device that uh, has a light beam going through the center. And I'm going to take this piece of paper and uh, turn it up. So what should happen is, so let, let's have some fun with this. <clears throat> so if I were to put this piece of paper halfway down, I should get half the intensity, right? So my sound should, you know, diminish in volume a little bit. Yeah, that, let's, maybe that'll work. Let's, let's see if it works. And nothing to do with double O2, but it's just fun. Louder. I can't make it loud. My loud. Coffee, my hand shaking. So, uh, so uh, I guess you did see uh, the, the lowering of volume, right? Okay. Okay. So, uh, no, just uh, way too much coffee, and so my hand was sh shaking too fast. So, it, uh, <clears throat> okay, imposing its own uh, sine wave on top of the uh, signal. Okay. So um, what did I show you? I mean, th this, was, uh, this was garbage, right? We had, uh, we had a nice little uh, signal input, and uh, the output was completely distorted because it was playing uh, sound over this, and uh, this is what happened. Switch to page 9. Now, this is what I would have liked to have happened. <clears throat> so on page 9, what I would have liked to see happen is this. Suppose I had a light emitting device that looked linear. Okay, straight line. Okay, where the current was linearly related to VD. Then what I would see is if I had a sinusoid here, then I would get a sinusoid here. No distortion there, right? But if, if only things were you know, like I wanted them, if I had a linear device, but I don't have a linear device. I have, a, I have an export dweeb. Because now you know why I call it a dweeb. It's not, you know, well, I'd like a linear device and it's exponential. But this is what I'd like. And if I had this, I won't show it to you today. If I had this, uh, my music would go through uh, without any distortion. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't have to run cables through my uh, attic. I could just use my garage door opener to play signals from my bedroom and our living room and so on, right? So the uh, so key thing here is how do I get this, OK? And uh, what I'd like you to do is uh, think about it yourselves. What I'm given is something like this. Think about yourselves. You know, what would you do? Um, see if you can come, come to me before lecture tomorrow uh, on Thursday and tell me the answer, OK?